Dr. Stephen Iliadi, welcome to the Earthy Delights podcast. What's the crack? Oh, I, I, I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, just to, uh, you know, since you said what's, what's the crack, and I, I, apparently I get like a free crack at anything. <laughs> it's Ilardi, not Iliadi. Ilardi, my bad. My, my yeah. bad. Hey, you know, I just I expected more from a fellow, fellow Italian. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, this, point, this, this is <laughs> this is poor. I might have to re. I might have to edit in the post. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you want to start over? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I'll see if I'm brave enough to put that out because uh, my dad will not be happy with that mispronunciation. Um, but no, thank you for coming on. It's been a long time in, in, in the making. I know you've been incredibly busy and uh, you just said that you've kind of, it's just all come to a stop at the moment in the academic year. So you're kind of uh, not not fully resting, but at least you've got a bit more time on your hands now. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I'm really ex- uh, excited to be able to join you. And um, this is actually a holiday for us here in, in the States. So it's, um, it's a time for rejuvenation and rest and um, it turns out that's one of the, the key elements in, in a treatment program that we're going to talk about in a bit. So, so it all works exactly. out. Beautiful. Lo- love, lovely little segue there. Well, actually, I mean, the, the, t- the key of the title will kind of give away what, we, what we're going to speak about today. But before we get into uh, your research and kind of your, your work that's changed so many people's lives, how, how is it that you got into it? How did you, how did you kind of stumble across this area and, and really get your, your teeth into it? Wow. That, that's such an insightful question. So I, have been a depression researcher as a clinical psychologist, as a PhD and a, a professor for about 30 years. Um, that's when I started grad school 30 years ago. And I was originally trained more in the realm of uh, cognitive neuroscience and applied, uh, basically applying what we know about the brain, what we know about the mind to different types of psychological suffering, like clinical depression. And I was trained in what was then, and I think arguably is still the leading form of psychological treatment for clinical depression, which some of your listeners will know as CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, I have even given workshops on CBT. And over the years, it became really clear to me that even though this form of treatment is sometimes helpful, that it was really only reaching about if we're really honest and, and really lucky, maybe one out of every two clinically depressed individuals. And because of my ne- neuroscience background, I'm also um, fairly conversant with the literature on antidepressant medications and also knew that medications leave a lot to be desired. And really, I mean, depending on where we set the bar for what kind of treatment outcome we're going to be satisfied with, they... I mean, I'll give you the glib, pithy quote, which is maybe one out of two depressed patients will get some sort of really nice, significant reduction in the short term from their suffering, which means one out of two will not. But then if we ask, well, what percentage of depressed patients will completely recover? And an analogy I like to use is, and I think one that a lot of people will relate to is like, if you've ever had a painful infection, like... Uh, a sinus infection or a case of strep throat or an ear infection. And you go to the doctor and you, and you, you know, typically would get an antibiotic and you're, you're thinking, well, you know, I don't just want a 50% reduction in my symptoms, which is by the way, is where we tend to draw the line with depression for saying that the drug worked. And a lot of listeners probably have no idea that's the case, but that's what we do. In the, if you read a clinical research study and it says, oh, half of all patients with depression responded to this med, what they typically mean is, well, they got at least a 50% reduction. But if you then read the fine print, what you find mm-hmm. is that if you get a 50% reduction over the first couple, two, three months that you take the medication, then your odds of having that improvement uh, continue all the way to full recovery are actually not that great. And in fact, the majority of depressed individuals who take a med and only do that and they don't change anything else about their life. Um, the majority will not get to full and enduring remission. Remission is, is, is sort of the key term, which means like completely recovered. So, you know, I had the misfortune to have an an ear, a painful ear infection uh, a couple of years ago. It was first, first one in my adult life. And, um, you know, I I go to the doctor, uh, otolaryngologist, ear specialist, and, get on an antibiotic. And I, I had about a 50% probably reduction in symptoms. I could hear a little better, wasn't as painful. I could sleep better. 
But, you know, I was not satisfied with that, right? And I bet if I had done nothing, the whole thing would have come back. So, um, you know, unfortunately, that's where we are with a lot of the medications. Well, actually, with all the medications for depression. But it's also where we are with the most widely used forms of psychotherapy. In other words, a lucky subset of people will get to complete and enduring remission, but it's probably more like 10 to 20%. And when I really, believe it or not, I mean, I had been in the field for over 10 years when I finally took the deep dive and took the most sobering, honest look at our data and looked in the mirror and said, we've got to do better. And my career was very traditional at that point. I, I had a big research grant from our National Institutes of Mental Health. It was about a $700,000 grant to study, uh, I, I thought a really interesting, but kind of esoteric topic of hemispheric lateralization in the brain of information processing in, in depression. In other words, how do the, the left and right hemispheres deal with negatively toned versus positively toned versus neutrally toned information? What if it's uh, visual? What if it's auditory? And so, you know, what if it's facial? And, you know, it, it, it was really rewarding, interesting research. And I threw it all, I didn't throw it all away. I, I walked away from all of it after I completed the, the grant and that study. It would have been a no brainer, not no pun intended. It would have been a no brainer to just continue doing that kind of research for the next 20 years. But, but instead I said, hey, I'm gonna reinvent my career because I had just stumbled across a, a monograph from, I, by the way, I think so often in, in the realm of scientific progress, it takes place in those really fertile areas of overlap between scientific disciplines, where there's cross fertilization mm -hmm. of ideas, of thought, of, of, mm -hmm. of fact and theory and method. And so anyway, I had just stumbled across a report by an anthropologist. So he's not in my field, right? He's an anthropologist named Edward Schieffelin. And he had lived with the Kaluli people of uh, a modern day Aboriginal, largely hunter-gatherer group of uh, the Papua New, Gu New Guinea Highland. And he was really interested in the question, you know, what kind of diseases do they get, including psychiatric illnesses? And he came back after a decade and he said, yeah, you know, they, they don't really get clinically depressed. They, they have bereavement. They, they, they suffer loss, um, but they don't have what we would recognize as, as syndromal depression. At least it's very rare. And he found one marginal case out of 2000 individuals that he extensively interviewed. And um, that really, it, 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 it turned my world upside down because what it did is it, it led me to start asking some very deep questions about whether or not depression might not actually fit a profile of illnesses that have come to be characterized by medical anthropology as diseases of civilization. Medical illnesses that are rampant in the affluent, industrialized, westernized, developed world. And by the way, we're talking about diseases. I mean, we, we can all think of them probably um, like obesity and diabetes and atherosclerosis and most forms of cancer, um, asthma and allergies and so forth. Autoimmune, autoimmune illnesses. illnesses. Yeah, autoimmune illnesses um, that are large. And all of these diseases are largely non-existent or very, very, very low prevalence among Aboriginal groups. Now, by the way, lest we um, think that that's you know, a completely dire contrast, we can also point to diseases that are endemic among Aboriginal groups that we don't have. And by far the biggest class of these uh, illnesses would be par parasitic in nature. So, you know, because they're, they're living in nature, they're, they're on a lifelong camping trip, effectively. Um, they are exposed to a parasitic burden that we've largely wiped out. Um, they're also obviously exposed to other kinds of microbial infection that we've, to a first approximation, learned how to, how to control. So um, it's not to say that somehow they're uh, freakishly healthy and we're, we're not, but it is to say that that lifestyle matters at a very, very profound level in determining what sorts of illnesses we're going to be vulnerable to. And, and the epiphany, the aha moment that I had so many years ago uh, was depression is a disease of civilization. 
and just throwing medication at it, therefore, is not working. And just throwing 12 weeks of standard psychotherapy at it for most patients is not working, at least not working the way we, we would hope. Um, and so that led me down a very deep rabbit hole of thinking about asking questions. Okay, well, what are they doing that's protective? In, in Papua New Guinea, you know, what are the Kaluli doing that's protective? What, what are the Chimane of Amazonian Bolivia doing that's protective? What are the Kungsan doing that's protective? What, what are the um, Amish, the, you know, the, the, the sort of 18th century lifestyle enclave that we have in the U.S.? Uh, some of your listeners have probably heard of the American Amish um, who still live basically like our ancestors did in an agrarian society three centuries ago. Um, they have a much lower rate of depression than the rest of American society. So what are they doing? And then, you know, conversely, wh what is 21st century society doing that is psychologically toxic? So, um, and I know I've been, I've, I've been just riffing here for like the last five, 10 minutes. So you, you guys are, are such gracious hosts. So feel free to jump in with questions or comments at any point, but I'm just going to leave you with a soundbite before you do. Okay. Please riff, please riff. <laughs> okay. Here's the brief riff. Um, it occurred to me after taking a couple of months and diving into the voluminous literature on clinical depression that hunter gatherers are doing many, many things that are naturally protective. They have many healing habits woven into the fabric of their day to day life. Conversely, we're doing some things that are, if I can use a fancy word, depressogenic. That, that have the potential to trigger depression. And so the pithy soundbite is you and I were never designed for the sedentary, fast food laden, sleep deprived, socially isolated, screen addicted, frenetic pace of 21st century modern life. And, and the outcome is an epidemic of clinical depression and many other forms of psychological suffering. Where do I start? When this when 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 COVID happened and there was a boom and all of a sudden countries like a domino effect just started getting locked down one after the other after the other and our motherland Italy was one of the first. Did that for someone like you who understands the importance like really truly understands the importance of social connection because I think a lot of us, we understand on a very surface level, you know, we think we know it's, it's important to see our loved ones. And so we don't really know how much that can actually play with our emotions, our hormones and everything else. For someone like you who, who understands the science behind that, was that a real scary kind of thought to think, oh, my God, the world could be locked down at the time. It was only for a couple of months, but what went on to be a year, well, in some places, even over a year now, um, is going to be locked down. What what kind of what's going to be the fallout from this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my my first thought was, um, you know, one of the big buzzwords here in the states was social distancing, and I hate that that term. I I mean, I understand it uh, epidemiologically, but social distancing is a recipe for psychological disaster. And so I, you know, I, I started encouraging people in my little modest platform. Uh, let's talk about um, physical distancing, you know, um, but, but not social. Like we, we need social connection. We need social belonging, e even if we may be physically a bit more distant. And, you know, I also did something a little bit maybe risky, although in hindsight, I was right. So it worked out, but I was very quickly convinced. And by quickly, I mean, oh, by April of 2020, by a brilliant cadre of aerosol scientists who were getting in the faces of the virologists and the epidemiologists and saying, this is primarily an airborne illness. It's not being transmitted by fomites, surface, you know, vectors like, you know, people rubbing their nose and touching a doorknob or, you know, I mean, at first everybody was like getting all kinds of disinfectants on their mail and, you know, packaging. 
which made sense for the first few weeks till we understood it. But, but I mean, it quickly became clear that this is a disease that is almost exclusively spread in crowded, poorly ventilated indoor spaces. Or, you know, and to a lesser extent in uncrowded, poorly ventilated indoor spaces, but not outdoors. And so, you know, my wife and I are, are part of a friend group and all of us, I remember it really clearly. It was, it was about two months into the, the sort of social distancing lockdown era. And we were all going stir crazy and just feeling really, really sad about the lack of face to face, you know, cause I, I really believe our brains, we're a very social species and our brains are wired for lots of face to face connection. And I think also physical contact, you know, hugs and appropriate touches and so forth um, with our with our friends and loved ones. Um, and I so I just had a, I, I sent a bunch of um, I, I think pretty well put together literature on the science of aerosol transmission and and the safety of the, the fact that we have almost zero evidence of of outdoor. Uh, aerosol transmission because you know they, you have infinite air volume and so aerosols quickly uh, disperse to non-infectious doses and so anyway long story short we started meeting back in May out on our uh, back deck um, at it where everybody was six feet apart from everybody else but it was a group of of eight close friends and we met once a week and it was like balm to the soul it was for all of us so incredibly meaningful just to have the physical connection with friends, even, even yes, we, you know, we could no longer greet each other with a hug, but, but um, it's really hard for me to put into words how meaningful that little social lifeline was. And now I say that uh, being extraordinarily lucky um, to have, you know, a wonderful marriage and, to have my daughter, who's an adult, and uh, her, she's newly married, and her husband, my son-in-law, we all decided uh, to be part of the same quarantine group early on because we're all super, super careful, and um, you know, so I got to see them all the time. But um, but yeah, I I nearly every day I would think about people that I know that were completely alone. Um, other than Zoom, other than, you know, seeing people on a screen. And yeah, it's, I mean, really genuinely concerning. And we have, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you want to dive too much into the the, the research that's come out on the, the toll on, on mental health of the pandemic, but I was really worried initially about young people. And one of the really fun things about science is sometimes the data come in and they completely overturn what you expect. You know, and, and this, this is one of those instances where the data from March and April and May of 2020 said that young people were actually looking a little better psychologically than they had, at least in the U.S., than they had before the onset of the pandemic, which was a bit of a mystery. And then uh, my colleague, Gene uh, Twenge at, at San Diego State, I think, broke the code on it, which is that um, young people are chronically sleep deprived in, in, the, in the States anyway. And um, so they had, now they were sleeping like two extra hours a night on average. And they were also spending, they were spending a lot more face-to-face -face time with their families, which, you know, can be a, a mixed bag and can be really toxic for some people, but on average uh, seemed to have been uh, really beneficial uh, initially. Now, as the pandemic wore on over the uh, ensuing year, then we saw rates of depression and anxiety go up at a population level. But at least initially it was, it was, I thought it was kind of informative that, huh, you know, even in a pandemic and all of the stress and uncertainty that, you know, and, and bereavement even that could go along with it, that we saw young people getting better while they were getting caught up on their sleep and, and at least some face-to-face -face time with their family. I wanted to ask as well, um, we talk about the social connection and we talk about, you know, it's now socially isolated is kind of another buzzword that's come about. But I, I, you know, I think to <clears throat> the tribes that you mentioned beforehand and how we used to live hundreds of thousands of years ago and everyone in that tribe had a very um, real 
um, need to be in that tribe and everyone depended on them for whatever it may have been. Um, and nowadays, even before COVID and long after COVID will, will be a distant memory, hopefully, um, we'll go back to our little social groups. But some of us, I feel, um, feel like we're indispensable, even though we may have friends, we may have family members who love us dearly. What actually do we really bring to the group? Are we actually really that important? Um, you know, and and I mean that very literally. I don't mean that. I'm not trying to say that in a depressive way, but just comparing it to the tribes that you talk about in Papua New Guinea, for example, where you have the hunter, where you might have the witch doctor, where you have the mother. and These are all integral members of the tribe. And without one of those members, the whole tribe kind of falls apart. And I feel like now, because there's so many of us, we all kind of lead... In, a, in one way, we're very unique, but in another way, we lead to kind of very similar lifestyles. Do you think that also, even though we may have friends and we may class ourselves as very loved and well insulated socially anyway, that that actually subconsciously might help or might um, give fuel to the fire in terms of that social isolation? Yeah, that's a really interesting hypothesis, Seb. So I, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing justice to the, the question. Is 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 it primarily you're wondering the extended social isolation that so many of us have felt has taken us out of our core social networks to a large degree and left us feeling like we don't have a clan anymore of our people or right? a, a sort of right. de facto tribe that would be, yeah, I, I, I think that's, I think that's accurate. I mean, I, I do think that one of the challenges, but maybe you could look at it. I mean, if we could do a, a glass half full sort of take on this, um, you know, there's an opportunity for people to reinvent, to reconnect, to maybe rethink what their primary tribe or clan or group, you know, who their people are going to be going forward. And what their role in that will be. I mean, I completely agree with you that our ancestors really never had to ask these kind of questions. I mean, you know, they, they were they were blessed and cursed maybe with the knowledge that their survival really depended on the the well being of the group, and the group's survival depended on the contribution of every single member. So everybody in the everybody in the clan knew that they were valued. There was safety in numbers. There was strength in numbers. So it didn't matter, you know, if I was part of this clan, if I'm like out of, let's say, 50 people in the clan, if I'm the 48th best hunter and the 49th best finder of uh, fresh water and the 47th best finder of edible, edible berries, I'm still making a contribution and I'm still valued and everybody's better off because I'm there, you know? So self-esteem was not nearly as fragile, uh, right? Because everybody sort of knew that they really, they, they counted, they mattered. And, and we crave that. We still crave that feeling of like, Oh, I've got my people, I've got my group and I matter to this group. And you know, and I'm, I've got a role that matters. I'm doing something, I'm bringing something to the table that matters with my group of friends, you know, whatever that, whatever that role is. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of groups will, social circles will have like, oh, he's the funny one. Oh, you know, she's the, she's the mom. Oh, she's the peacemaker. Oh, you know, um, and we all know what our roles are. And, and I, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of that's been lost probably for, for an enormous, for millions of people. And, and now we all need to think about how we can, can reestablish that and maybe establish it in a, in a novel way that, that even um, suits us better. And Jim, I, I, I know you, you were going to jump in with something. Yes. Uh, the question, a lot of questions to come up, but the question that I'd like to ask now is, a few years ago, when I was kind of in the midst of a pretty tough time, I came across this uh, this video uh, where Charles Eisenstein was speaking in an interview. I don't know if you're familiar with, with his work, but he mentioned something to say that he believes that de depression is actually a sign of health. Depression is actually a, like a, a thing coming from the deepest part of you to say, hey, 
you need to change how you're living. You, you need to, like the body is saying no per se. Uh, and I wonder if you think that that perspective would really flip it hugely for a lot of people uh, compared to the stigma that depression carries now where, oh, Jesus, he's depressed. Oh, I hope he can just get better now in a few weeks or I hope he can shake that off. or hope the medicine works. Um, to, to look at it like, wow, this is a signal from my body, from a big part of me, from my soul, however you want to look at it to say, I need to change. This is this is not meeting my needs. Yeah, I, I think there's some real wisdom there, but I, I would also introduce maybe a caution as well, because I think that perspective is is incomplete. And maybe the best analogy that I can give is one of physical physical pain. Physical pain, which uh, and, and by the way, interestingly enough, the brain circuitry that uh, allows us to experience Physical pain is right next door to the circuits that do emotional pain and they're cross wired. And so when we have very excruciating physical pain, we also experience it emotionally and uh, people who have excruciating emotional pain and severe depression often um, will report that it, it feels like physical torment as well. So if we think about physical pain, absolutely true that in the short term, especially it is a critical, important signal that something needs to be attended to. There's tissue damage or potential damage. There's something, an injury that needs to be mended, um, caution that needs to be taken, whatever, immediate action that needs to be taken. If it's like, you know, the, the, the stabbing pain of like, you know, somebody who gets too close to a fire or something or touches a burner. Um, but there's also... Uh, an array of chronic pain syndromes that are no longer conveying useful information. In, in fact, now they're pathological and they're not telling us anything important other than there's something pathological happening here. And um, so when somebody has pathological chronic pain, we're, we're not looking for, oh, what can we learn from this? Usually, I mean, assuming that any genuine medical or physical, you know, problem can be ruled out medically. Um, and, and I think that that's really more analogous to what clinical depression is like. So in other words, sadness and bereavement are universal human adaptations. It's, a, it's an adaptation. It's a part of the human experience. We all are hardwired to experience emotional pain when we experience loss, when we experience bereavement, failure, setback. And it can often be enormously informative. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot that pain can teach us. And by the way, that's, you know, I, I really don't want to come on here and bash psychiatric medication, but one of the challenges of psychiatric medication is they tend to numb or blunt the brain's ability to register emotional pain. And mm -hmm. as you may have heard um, computer science or program programmer types say, you know, they'll, they'll joke and they'll say, oh, that's not a bug. That's a feature. Have you heard that expression? It's not a bug. It's a feature. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. emotional numbing is not a bug. It's not a side effect. It is a feature of antidepressant medications. It's a feature of anti-anxiety medications. Okay. Um, they turn down the, the, the intensity of emotion, positive and negative, by the way. And so for somebody who's really suffering, then that can feel like a pretty good deal, right? And by the way, there are people whose emotions are so intense all the time that they can be more adaptive and better calibrated with a bit of numbing, with a bit of blunting. If you, you think about sort of the optimal signal to noise ratio um, that our emotions convey, but, um, you know, I... I have seen so many hundreds of people who have been numbed too far and they're like, well, you know, my anxiety is better. I still get kind of anxious, but it's not as horrible. My depression, my suffering is better, but I'm just kind of flat. I'm just kind of numb all the time. I don't get as excited about anything. I've known people that have fallen out of love, um, that have fallen out of romantic attraction with their partner after beginning a psychiatric medication. And we don't talk about this a whole lot because, you know, it's, it's, 
it's upsetting, uh, A, and it doesn't fit with the narrative. You know, it doesn't fit the zeitgeist, but it, it it's real. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't know, Jim, if, if I really fully answered your question, but I guess what I would say is I've treated hundreds of people with clinical depression where I think their suffering had long since passed the point where it had a lot to teach them. I think it was now more analogous I to chronic you. pain syndrome. So oh, my goal I really was really- appreciate this really answer. Thanks for that, Stephen. Uh, and before Seb hots in, and before we get down to the twelfth or the your six core fundamentals, I just wanted to ask him. Um, I'm partial to a somewhat radical lifestyle change, and I can imagine, surely, given you, you, this this point in your career where you said that you were you were looking at these neurological uh, patterns in the brain, and, and then you find it out this discovery, and you hear about the indigenous population. I don't think I'm crazy to assume that maybe some thoughts popped in your head thinking, wait a minute, are we doing it all wrong? Do I need to go back? And yeah, so I'd love to know if if there was a pretty significant lifestyle change for you when you made all this discovery. Yeah, that's a that's I love that question. Um, You know, what's what's funny, Jim, is there should have been right. I mean, if if I were a a fully consistent human being. I would have had a radical reorientation of, of everything. And, and, um, but that's not how it worked for me. It was more gradual. You know, I, I started, and I, by the way, I think this is actually the way most people make changes is, you know, you start with one thing at a time. Um, so I just thought, well, you know, I'm going to start making changes as I can and sort of see how it goes. And a big impetus for that was I designed uh, what we call TLC or therapeutic lifestyle change, a, a, a lifestyle based treatment program for depression and began running some pilot uh, studies, basically treating patients with this experimental protocol with my team of I had five graduate students at the time, all in a clinical PhD program. So they were all um, four of the five were at the master's level. So they, they all could, could do some therapy as well. They could be co-therapists. And um, I found myself looking patients in the eyes and asking them to make these changes and noticing the very extreme discomfort of feeling like, like a, a hypocrite, feeling like, wait a minute, I'm asking mm patients to do things that I'm not even really doing. I'm asking them to prioritize mm. sleep, to adopt these habits of healthy sleep in ways that I haven't fully internalized. I'm asking them to um, prioritize connection and belonging over all else um, when I'm a workaholic. <laughs> you know, I'm not as much now, mm. thank, thank goodness. But it's, mm-hmm. um, so I, you know, I, I think it was an evolutionary process over the next couple of years for me and for many of my graduate students where we all sort of felt collectively like, well, we got to step up our game. Like we can't ask people to do things that we're not willing to do ourselves. And so mm-hmm. it's been mm-hmm. very personally beneficial, I would say, uh, as well as thrilling to see so many people um, find healing from their depression that had Roughly half of the folks that, um, you know, that, that have come through our program, roughly half um, were on antidepressant meds at the time and had not found them to be very helpful. Uh, many others had tried the meds or tried traditional therapy in the past and, and sometimes side effects, sometimes just, you know, sometimes money, sometimes, I mean, lots of different reasons for people to, to not um, continue. But usually it was because the meds just didn't deliver the goods. And they, by the way, they felt they always felt like it was their fault. They always felt like they were freaks. They, they, you know, they had no idea that this was like, hey, that's about one out of every two depressed patients. They were shocked when mm. when I would tell them that, and then I would show them published studies, and they still could barely believe their own eyes. Um, they're like, oh, but all I, I hear all the commercials and everybody talks about it. I've got a chemical imbalance, and you know, surely meds are the only way to fix it. And you know, so we had to do a lot of psychoeducation. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it's been both professionally thrilling, clinically inspiring, but also personally really, really beneficial as well. 
So I appreciate that question. Thanks for your honesty, Stephen. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate the yeah. honesty that it leads perfectly into, I mean, you said that one and two, it, medication doesn't work for one and two patients. And it kind of like leads perfectly into the, the reason why, well, the way I found you and the reason why you've kind of gained notoriety in this subject area is your kind of six steps that you, you believe can really help someone overcome depression. And one of, I will go through them all, but one of the ones I think is, uh, the most or initially seems to be the most surprising at least for me anyway but then afterwards when you think about it, it makes complete sense it is exposure to sunlight um and <clears throat> listeners of the podcast may know jim has uh, a strong affinity with italy and he'll list off a number of reasons but i'm and to be fair he's never said this to me but i'm pretty sure um that maybe one of the subconscious reasons anyway would be the sunlight compared to what he uh he does or doesn't get, should I say, in Dublin anyway. Um, and I can definitely speak to that from when I moved out to when I moved to Madrid from England. Um, I not- I could noticeably tell the difference in my mood just on a daily basis when you see that sun, when the day lasts longer in the winter, in the winter months. And I remember talking to one of my Spanish friends, Tamara, and she she did a little stint in England, a couple couple of years working in England, and she eventually had to move back to Spain. And she said one of the reasons she's moved back to Spain was because she couldn't deal with the weather. She couldn't deal with how wet it was, how grey it was, how dark it was, uh, and how cold it was. And I remember thinking, because we were talking about um, the poor kind of wages that you get in Spain. And so I was, we were talking about how in England you were on average you kind of earn a lot more and i remember thinking i was just moved over to madrid and i remember thinking what a ridiculous statement i mean christ there's more to life than like sun i mean if you're gonna you know i'd rather be somewhere i'm gonna earn more um, and I, now i understand the hypocrisy of that statement having just moved from england to spain but now having lived in spain for a number of years i can't imagine moving back to england or any other climate where i know that I'm going to have to, or where sunlight is going to be a real precious commodity where I can't bank on it on a daily basis. Um, could you speak to us about like why, number one, why is it so important for our mental health? Uh, yeah. Just speak to that, please. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, so a few things again, our, our ancestors until about 10,000 years ago were outside constantly. And I mean, literally, you know, on a lifelong camping trip with their 50 closest friends and relatives, um, plus or minus a few. But um, even until a couple of centuries ago, really until the Industrial Revolution, most people still worked outside, spent most of the daylight hours outdoors. And the, okay, so it turns out that sunlight, outdoor light, is dramatically brighter than indoor lighting. And it, and it profoundly influences the brain and the rest of the body in ways that I think most people really have never learned, never been exposed to. And just to give you a sense of the scale, if you step outside on a sunny day, it's likely to be 100 to 500 times brighter than it was inside your well-lit apartment or or home, or office, 100 to 500 times brighter. If you step outside on a cloudy day, it's still likely to be about 10 times brighter outside. And we don't notice this because of the exquisite design of the eye and its aperture for you know adjusting to light gradients. But, but we notice it when we try to take a photo with an old camera without a flash indoors. Right. I mean, our, our iPhones can handle that just fine. They're designed to. But any older camera is going to really struggle with indoor light. They just it's not enough. And um, here's the thing. The back of the eyeball, the, the business part of the eyeball for vision is called the retina. Most listeners probably know about this. The retina is literally um, physiologically. It's part of the brain. Did you guys know that the retina if you look at the type of nervous tissue, the type of cells that are lining the retina, they're really, they're brain cells, histologically speaking. And so you can think of the retina as like the forward outpost of the brain. And it has 
one of the three types of cells that it has, we know about rods and cones that specialize in um, color vision and uh, night black and white vision. But there's a third type of cell that we don't learn about in school that's a photoreceptor. It's just basically trying to pick up on the luminance, how bright are local conditions. And there aren't as many of these, but, but there are quite a few. And these cells have a broadband connection to the center of the brain where we think of the so-called body clock. For people keeping score at home, it's called the suprachiasmic nucleus or the SCN of the hypothalamus. And it's the body clock, basically. And because our ancestors were always outside, they had a body clock that did not have to be terribly accurate. It was not like a Rolex watch. There, by the way, there are species that have extremely accurate body clocks, but we're not one of them. We didn't need to, we didn't need to evolve that because our ancestors got a reset um, every morning. Why? Because if you're sleeping outside when it's more or less pitch dark most of the time, or very, you know, very, very dark, um, and then you're outside when the sun comes up, even on a cloudy day, your brain can notice like, oh, it just got hundreds of times brighter. That's the reset. Let's reset the body clock. And then in turn, we'll reset our sleep architecture. We'll re reset our... Uh, cycle of hormone release, arousal, cortisol surge to get us booted up in the morning. I mean, melatonin surge later, you know, 16 hours later to get us really prepared to sleep again, all of it. And um, that's the way we're wired for outdoor living. And okay, so how about this? Particles of light, photons, are literally a drug that's delivered to the outpost of the brain, we call the retina. And most dwellers of modern 21st century societies, most of us are chronically de deprived of this vital drug. And not only does that drug, the light, play this pivotal role in resetting our body clock, which has all these downstream effects, but it has even other cool effects that ripple out immediately in terms of ramping up activity in dopamine-based circuitry, you know, we think about dop dopamine as a so-called feel-good neurotransmitter. Why? Because it's it's the chemical messenger in our pleasure centers, our reward centers, our motivation centers of the brain. And so, by the way, dopamine is the main uh, molecular target for stimulant medications that people take for conditions like ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity. Well, um, light has stimulant effects. Light has attention-enhancing effects based on its ability to ramp up dopamine signaling. But it gets better. Light also enhances serotonin signaling. So um, people also probably know about serotonin as the main chemical signaling, signaling agent in the brain that kind of puts the brakes on the stress response, that puts the brakes on emotional pain that gives us a feeling of soothing and well-being, not, not pleasure so much as just sort of soothing. And light also can have that sort of effect. It, it can have a, an anti-anxiety effect for some people. Now, their individual results will vary with that because some people at high doses of light get more of the energizing dopaminergic effect rather than the calming serotonergic effects. So there are going to be a lot of individual differences here. But generally speaking, light will do both beneficial things for us. So it's extremely powerful to live, to move from a, you know, forgive me, but often a very gloomy place like England to, a, or, or, or God forbid, um, uh, Dublin, uh, which, you know, I hear is a lovely place, but, but not noted for it's exuberant sunlight. Uh, <coughs> to move from a place like that to Spain or Italy, I mean, that, that's dramatic. Now, the next best thing, and I, by the way, I just did this for a friend of mine uh, who lives in Belfast. I just bought him a, um, well, actually, I take it back. He bought for his family, on my recommendation, a 10,000 Lux light box. So a an artificial box that's electric that simulates the intensity of full spectrum sunlight 
um, which has extraordinary therapeutic value and has been studied in literally dozens of randomized controlled, like gold standard clinical trials. It's antidepressant, not just for people that have winter onset depression or seasonal depression, but antidepressant for any of us. Um, so what I bought my friend was uh, a cool little add on to this, which we call a dawn simulator light. Um, so for people like my friend who have to wake up to a, um, an alarm clock when it's still dark, which by the way, is kind of unnatural, right? To, I mean, don't you guys hate that? Like when you have to wake up and it's still pitch dark outside and you're alarm. Well, the dawn simulator light, you, you put it on your bed stand and you tell it the time you want to wake up and it starts getting brighter and brighter and brighter, shining in your face while you're lying in bed, tricking your brain into thinking the sun has just come up. And for people that have a lot of trouble booting up in the winter, especially, um, you know, when the sun doesn't come up till much later, it, it's, it's very therapeutic. So anyway, that's a very, Seb, I gave you a crazy long answer to, to your question, but ho hopefully, uh, hopefully I hit some of the key bases there. No, 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 don't worry. We love the crazy long answers. Um, and you said a few points there that, that let, that kind of lead nicely into, to one of your other points, which is, um, a good amount of sleep or health and healthy sleep as well. Not just the, the, the number of, uh, the number of hours that you managed to clock in. And, um, I think there was, I forget his name now off the top of my head, but an English researcher who Matthew appeared Walker. on the Joe Rogan. Yeah, there you go. Matthew Walker who appeared on the Joe Rogan show and he spoke specifically about sleep. And since then it's kind of got into everyone's consciousness, but, um, and you talked as well about how, why we go to sleep or why, we used to go to sleep based on the, the sun and when it wasn't in the sky and when it was in the sky. And nowadays we have screens which keep us awake for ungodly hours if we're scrolling through our social media, um, even if it is pitch black outside. Um, how important is it to get real good sleep? What are the actual kind of physiological benefits of clocking in a healthy seven, eight, nine hours, possibly every night of undisturbed sleep? Um, and... For people who think um, that, you know, just using their phone, oh, I'm just going to check through my social media the last five minutes and then I'll go to sleep straight away. How damaging is that to actually getting really good sleep? Because I've tried to, ever since I've seen Matthew Walker's podcast, I'm not saying that I do it successfully. Sometimes I fail miserably, but I do try to turn off the screen time and at least like half an hour to an hour before bedtime, just read a book or something that's more natural um, and not kind of so aggressive on my eyes. And I find myself actually just falling asleep a lot quicker, actually. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there in that question. Great. Yeah. Great sorry. Another long no. answer, but we're, we're here for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you guys, man, much, much, much respect. Um, I, I hope your listeners are equally patient, but we'll, I guess that's an empirical question. We'll, we'll find out. Um, all 10 of them. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. All hundreds of thousands of them. Um, there we go. That's accurate. That's more accurate. So, <laughs> sleep is so much more profoundly important for proper brain function and proper health than I think anyone really anticipated 30, 40 years ago. And the more we learn, the more it's, it's really pretty mind boggling. Um, one, one of the biggest, I, I remember as an undergraduate, um, somebody asked a professor, you know, why do we sleep? And it was still a pretty profound mystery. Um, I mean, really, truly a scientific mystery. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of hypotheses and speculation, but that probably the main function of sleep that we know now um, was not even on the radar then, which is sleep is a, a state during which the brain is able to power down enough to clear out all of the metabolic byproducts, all the waste products, all the toxins, all the stuff that builds up during the day that needs to be shunted out. Um, and then for nutrients to be shunted back in to replenish, to get the proper fuel not only for neurons, the, the main brain cells, but, but they have a, uh, an army of support staff that we call glial cells that um, also keep everything humming along smoothly. 
And so sleep can be thought of first and foremost as a time of replenishment and restoration and renewal. It's a time also, by the way, when there's a lot of repair to damage that builds up during the day. Um, you know, probably a lot of listeners have heard terms like um, oxidative stress um, or, you know, they've heard about free radicals. So there, you know, all kinds of molecules in the brain that are very reactive and can slice and dice the um, neuronal machinery. They can damage a lot of damage. And, you know, as any, anybody who's ever owned a car or a motorcycle, you know, knows if, if you don't do the routine maintenance, um, over time, the, the damage will build up and, and eventually things stop working. And so if we don't do the repair work of sleep, brain cells die. And over time, the damage can be really considerable. So um, sleep is the lowest hanging fruit for anyone who wants to improve their mental performance, their memory, their clarity, their mood, their sense of well-being, their immune function. I mean, it's just right there. I'm not saying, by the way, it's a panacea. I mean, a lot of other things have to go right for us to be fully healthy and hitting on all cylinders. But if this thing is going wrong, then we're going to be in trouble. And so many people have convinced themselves or they've allowed themselves to be convinced that somehow they, they, they should be fine on five or six hours a night. And they may try to mask their sleep deficit with stimulants, which, you know, is understandable, but it's not the same thing as actually giving the brain what it needs. And, um, you know, there, there's a particularly restorative type of sleep that probably you heard about on, on the podcast um, with Dr. Matthews, which is, um, it, it goes by a number of different names, but uh, s- slow wave sleep, Delta wave sleep, non-REM sleep. It's the deepest, most restorative phase of sleep. Uh, REM is way more famous, right? Random eye uh, uh, movement, uh, rapid eye movement sleep. But, but REM, I mean, REM has, has some important functions, but it, it's, it's not as important as this deep phase of sleep. And here's the thing. If we go to sleep highly stressed, if we are in a state of, of stressful arousal, whether that's from interacting on social media or reading a news story that's very upsetting, or um, even just working right up until the moment before bedtime, or maybe just having a kind of lifestyle that ramps up our stress response all day long, and we have nothing in our lives to slam the brakes on that stress response. Then we go to sleep, and we're not going to get that deep restorative phase of sleep. It's a really interesting evolutionary adaptation. But when vertebrate animals go to bed stressed out, they don't get deep sleep because their brain is thinking, oh, there's danger. There's there's threat. You need to be hypervigilant. And that means you cannot afford to go into deep sleep. You must keep it light. You must wake up frequently to scan. And so when people go to bed stressed out, you know, they'll report the next day. It's like, ah, I guess I slept seven hours, but I, man, I don't feel rested. You know, uh, I was awake a lot. It just, it wasn't restorative. And so, there, you know, there are a lot of moving parts. Here, but basically, we need to attend both to the quantity of sleep. The average adult needs between seven to eight hours a night and the quality. And both are critical. And, um, You know, it's going to take a little experimentation for each of us to figure out, are we a seven hour a night person or an eight hour a night person to be fully rested? And that's an easy experiment to do, really. Um, I mean, if you want, I can can give you an insider pro tip on how to tell. Do you want to hear it? Please, please. (laughs) Okay, here's the insider pro tip. So, well, I mean, the big question is, am I sleep deficient or not? Am I getting enough sleep? How do I know? Well, a really clever way that sleep researchers have figured out, I mean, they could put you in a sleep lab and hook you up to a polysonograph and all the electrodes and, you know, and so forth. They don't really need that. They can just put you early afternoon. So let's say, um, you know that feeling you get if you haven't had enough sleep right after lunch, 
where you just start to kind of drift off a little bit. You're just like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay awake for this meeting um, or this podcast. Mm-hmm. Huh? Um, but, but um, <laughs> never the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Never the podcast. Um, if you look at a, if you look at a room, by the way, of um, six year olds that have to go to a boring school assembly or something, you know, or they're just doing something really boring in class. Um, you know, most of the time, six-year-olds get enough sleep because their parents are pretty good about making sure they do. And, um, you know, when they're bored, they don't get drowsy. They get restless, right? Well, that's that's also true for uh, adequately rested grown-ups. If you, if you have an adequately rested grown-up and they're doing something boring, I mean, a quick little heuristic is, am I getting sleepy or am I getting restless? If I'm getting sleepy, that's a sign. But, but now here's the, here's the acid test. And I, w- I want all your listeners to consider trying this. So right after lunch, go into a quiet room, turn on a white noise machine if you need to, if you think there might be any distracting sounds, put on a sleep mask. And by the way, sleep masks are, are very easy to make, but you can also buy one you know, for about five euros, uh, maybe a little less. And, or if you have blackout curtains, that's fine. But get it really dark um, and really quiet. Get a spoon or some other metal, uh, you know, appliance. Hold it in your hand. Drape it over the edge of the bed and have a metal cookie tray or baking sheet directly below it. Set a timer for 10 minutes. Okay. And if you can lay there in this little sensory deprivation chamber that you've created for yourself for 10 minutes without startling awake to the sound of the spoon clanging on the metal below because you've fallen asleep and lost your grip, then you're probably not horribly sleep deprived. It, it, it is yeah. almost everyone who's sleep deprived will fall asleep within 10 minutes um, if they try that experiment. Every Spanish person listening to this will definitely do so because of the siesta. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. how many people, how many Spanish people pass that test. Interestingly, a little fact that I like to share about the Spanish siesta: people think that we that in Spain they have it because it's so hot or or what or they're just kind of lazy or whatever the case may be. And the actual fact, and it kind of goes to, back to your point about sunlight. Um, the reason that um, Spain and the Spanish have the siesta is because, in actual fact, if you look at them on a globe, they should have the same they should be on the same hour as england that madrid directly south to pretty much to london basically it should be on the same time schedule but because of the history of franco and hitler franco changed it to be more european so to be in line with hitler and to kind of buddy up with him and as a result you get more sunlight i.e., you get more kind of daytime your days longer your nights Later. actually shorter. So we're actually, yeah. th- thanks to Franco, uh, the Spanish people, they might love a terrace out there with a cerveza, but they are all sleep deprived and they don't know it. And that's why they actually, that's why the Spanish siesta is a thing and is like built into the culture is because they're on the wrong kind of time schedule. They should be put really an hour back. And if they did so, then it would kind of sort out all of those words. But yeah, it's a nice little fact that I read on the guardian and that kind of uh, stayed with me. I like to share that whenever I get the opportunity. I love it. Yeah. And it turns out that um, people who already have very healthy habits of sleep and are getting enough sleep, uh, they can take a nap with impunity. But for people that, that actually have insomnia or any other sort of sleep disorder, um, napping dramatically reduces their sleep drive when they go to bed and will amplify usually their sleep problems. And so we always ask people that have insomnia or some other, most other forms of sleep disorder, uh, while we're getting their sleep in very healthy, good shape to, to refrain from napping. Jim, I know you had a few questions on sleep. Did, did we cover everything there, or did you have any more any more doubts over there? Um, no, I, 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 unless there's anything, Steve, that you missed that you think would be helpful for someone who says, like, I sleep six, seven hours, or I sleep eight hours, but say I don't think the quality is great, or uh, I, is there anything that you would recommend just generally that for them to improve their sleep or if they wake up and they don't feel like they did get the deep REM, as you said. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So there is a phenomenal uh, treatment protocol for insomnia and it's just really good. Um, you know, what I call in my book, um, the depression cure and in our treatment program, um, we call them habits of healthy sleep, but we're not reinventing the wheel. We're, we're, and I, and I always, um, you know, give the appropriate citation. We are basically distilling principles that have long since been known about in a, in a treatment program called CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. And listeners who are um, fans of better living through smartphone apps, there is a, a really brilliant little app that's completely free called, I believe it's called CBTI Coach. And it basically just helps coach the individual through these various habits of healthy sleep. One of which, I mean, and, and most of them are pretty common sense. A, little, a few of them maybe are l- less well known. Um, it turns out that if we go to bed, if we're having sleep uh, problems, if we go to bed at the same time every night and get up at the same time every morning, the brain will slowly become trained to that schedule And, you know, in the same way that children really thrive on routine, children thrive on, you know, predictability and routine. Well, the brain is is kind of like a child in that way. It wants predictability and routine. And when we give it the same bedtime every night and the same wake time every morning, or at least the same time getting out of bed, even if, you know, if we're already awake, um our sleep circuitry in the brain starts to optimize and it gives us a more powerful sleep drive at night. And more importantly, our sleep becomes more efficient. And so we get more of the critical sleep work done in less time. We actually start needing a little less sleep, um, which is really cool. The The most important um, single thing is to make sure that we get up at the same time. That may be a little counterintuitive because a lot of times if somebody has onset insomnia, and it takes them three hours to fall asleep. They're like, oh my God, I have to sleep in because otherwise I'm going to be a zombie. But it turns out, no, uh-huh. you, you, you need to get up at the same time because that's how your brain gets trained for what the window of sleep is. Uh-huh. And it's like, yeah, you're going you're gonna to take that today. You're going to be sleepy today, but it's going to be so much easier for you to fall asleep tonight. And your sleep is going to be much higher quality tonight. And it's going to be, you know, training. The other thing that's really powerful is um, making it colder in the bedroom at night. Uh, Because uh, for our ancestors who are outside, you know, it was always colder at night. Uh, And Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. literally turning down the temperature by at least three degrees uh, Celsius is, is super helpful. And powerfully amplifies uh, sleep drive and the quality of, of sleep. So those are a few, a, a few. I mean, there are lots of other things we could talk about, but those are a few of the. Oh, I'll, I'll just say this as well. Many of the other elements of the TLC program that we've developed are helpful for sleep. And so, bright light in the morning is helpful for sleep that night um, because it, it um, sets up the time for for melatonin release, which is a hormone that prepares the brain for sleep. So if we get bright light in the morning, that helps. If we get exercise during the day, physical activity, that promotes sleep drive as well. If we um, have adequate dietary omega-3 fats, that seems to also be sleep enhancing in its effect. If we learn how to stop ruminating how to notice when we're dwelling on negative thoughts, whether they're thoughts of um, sadness, depressive thoughts, or thoughts of anxiety, you know, thoughts of future threat, Um, learning how to turn off the rumination treadmill is critically important uh, as well. So anything we can do to slam the brakes Mm -hmm. on stress response circuitry is going to help our sleep quality and quantity. Beautiful. That's great. Um, uh, I wanted to to move on to the I think that the point that resonated with the most with me out of all of your out of the six of your points, which is exercise, um, because you you kind of brought a point in where you said that um, basically 
exercise that has no end goal that has no kind of objective we find is not the right thing to do basically if you can find a something better um then then do that and i literally just this week had just been saying to jim that i'd kind of try to get on a have a healthier lifestyle um real try and shift try to lose some weight that i've put on over the kind of corona year i'm going to refer to it as and uh by saying that i, I re- really hate gyms i've always just hate i find them so boring and i just always put it down to that i was just ill-disciplined I just didn't have enough kind of discipline. Maybe I didn't really want to lose the weight enough to put myself in that gym every single day. However, that said, I, it's not that I'm an, I'm an inactive person. I love sports, but that's because I don't see sport as exercise as such. I'm just playing that sport. And as a byproduct of that sport, I then, you know, get to exercise, get to burn the calories and so on. And you mentioned, you know, that these uh, the Aborigines in these tribes, they never say that they're doing exercise. They just say that they're living um and then you you brought up the point as well about the the rat on the treadmill the t- and the the lab rat on a treadmill i just wondered if you could for people who kind of maybe aren't aware of what i'm talking about if you could just elaborate because it's something that really resonated with me it's the first time i've ever heard someone talk about exercise the way you did yeah absolutely so um and seb you you cut out for just a second there i want to make sure you can still hear me okay before i go on perfect i can hear you perfect so um yeah i mean w- one of the things I like to tell people who struggle with this, and by the way, most people struggle with exercise. Uh, and I say it's, it's because exercise is completely unnatural. We are not designed to exercise. In fact, there's circuitry running in our brains, just like uh, the brains of a lab rat or any other mammal that we know of. Circuitry that basically says, be as lazy as humanly possible. Be as lazy Conserve energy when you can, conserve effort when you can, which, you know, if you think about it, made perfect sense for our ancestors who lived in a world where there would be occasional food shortages, where they would occasionally have to fast for a few days or maybe several days, where they also had just the demands of of daily life would often call on them to maybe burn 4,000, 5,000 calories a day just living they're very physically active. And so, you know, actually, let me give you a little friendly amendment. Um, Our circuitry says, be as active as you need to in the service of meaningful goals, goals that matter. Otherwise, be as lazy as you possibly can. And our dilemma is that we have now engineered the need for physical activity out of modern life. And so we have a population that is very sedentary, that knows intellectually exercise is good for me. I should do it. You know, I just need to muster up the willpower, not realizing that their brain is not having it. You know, the brain is saying, no, 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 this is good. You should be lazy. You should sit on the couch and binge Netflix, damn it. Um, you know, that that's the good life. You're living the dream. How do you not realize? How do you not realize that you're living? Well, because I'm getting overweight, because I'm out of shape, because, right? And, and I know intellectually this is not healthy for me. And so, you know, it's a conundrum. And the, the solution is, Seb, I think just really building on what you've already discovered, which is we have to basically hack our motivational circuitry. We we have to recognize what we're up against and then say, okay, you know, probably for me getting on a treadmill is not going to work. Probably for me getting on an exercise bike is just not going to, I mean, some people, by the way, can make that work. And I have to confess that once I started telling myself that I could only listen to a certain podcast while I was on an elliptical trainer, it's like, okay, I can, I can make that. That's enough motivation for me. I, I can make that happen. But I'm a little bit of a freak that way. Um, but I agree with you. Um, back, you know, before I, before I got really old, uh, too old, to, well, too old to safely run. Once I try, I'll put it this way. Once I turned 50 and I noticed how long it was taking me to heal from injuries running full court basketball, you know, it just, it's just a fact of aging. It just takes longer to heal. Um, 
was like, you know, I, I mean, basketball was such a, a beautiful workout for me because it never felt like work. And I always worked so much harder in that hour. It was that really beautiful exhaustion where like you've just pushed yourself so hard. You didn't even know you could push that hard. Um, and I've had that experience out on the football pitch as well. I mean, I've had it playing, um, playing singles tennis as well. Like, you know, when you're just running all over the court, um, racquetball, I mean, you know, there it's like the sky's the limit there, but, um, I think here's the thing. All of us are going to have to do the trial and error work to figure out what is the kind of physical activity that hacks my brain so that I'm enjoying it and I'm really physically active and it doesn't feel like I'm working. And, you know, for some people, it's going to be a, a dance class. For some people, it's going to be a workout video. For a lot of men and a few women, but a lot more men that I know, it's lifting weights, doing resistance training with a friend. And that was a hack that I found uh, about a decade ago with a friend of mine. And, um, and we only get together now once a week to lift, but it's a really, it's a really fun time. And we go at it hard, um, way harder than either of us probably would on our own, you know, cause we have a little friendly competition, oh, yeah. but it's very friendly. It's very, you know, it's, it's super fun. I, and how does, how does that, um, kind of for people who may be, cause I, look, I'm, I've got my girlfriend here, but I haven't got a kid that I have to look after. My my boss is really nice. So he doesn't kind of make me stay until, you know, ungodly hours to do work. He's very strict on the fact that we do have a personal life. So he allows us to kind of, you know, if I want to do sports after work, I've got that, I've got that opportunity. But I know a lot of people who listen to this, they might just feel like that is just, it's a luxury that they don't have because of their lifestyle, because of certain things that they can't change as much as they would like to. How can someone like that, maybe, you know, a, a single mum, for example, or someone along the, along that line of, um, how can they try to incorporate some sort of physical activity? What's like the, yeah. what's the kind of the base limit, like the absolute minimum that you could do that would actually kind of really improve um, your mental health? And if you have depression or you're on really, depression, yeah. get you over it. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because, you know, really the most natural activity is walking. For most people, I mean, aside from, you know, um, less common disabilities, but, but the vast majority of, of adults can can uh, engage in what what's often called aerobic level brisk walking. So walking like you're running late for the bus, running late for the train or, you know, like really, really moving like you mean it. Um, and, you know, I would say no matter how busy somebody is, they can usually carve out um, 40 minutes maybe to go for a brisk walk, you know, because it could be a social time. It can be a time to gather your thought. I mean, you know, so many other things can happen while we're walking, but, um, one of my graduate school mentors is a pioneer in the mental health benefits of exercise. His name is James Blumenthal. If any listeners want to look it up and he did these landmark studies with clinically depressed, mostly middle-aged adults randomly assigned to get Zoloft. Um, I don't know if you have that in your respective countries. It's, it's a an antidepressant. It's the generic is um, sertraline. It may go by a different name there, um, but it's, it's a very well, I'm sure it does. Yeah. It's, it's an SSRI um, Zoloft or um, 30 minutes of walking in the aerobic zone three times a week. That's a very low dose of exercise. 30 minutes. Now, by the way, it takes about 10 minutes before your heart rate gets up into the aerobic range. So, you know, for a typical sort of, let's just say, of what's the average or median age of your listeners? Maybe 30? I'm just guessing. Yeah, around 30. Yeah. 30, 35. Yeah. 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 No, you're uh, right on. Dead on. Okay. So, um, you know, the formula for max heart rate is, is 220 minus your age. It's a good guesstimate. So 190. And then if you're at at least 70, percent of that. So, you know, let's, let's, let's be ambitious and say 75% of that. So if somebody has got their heart rate up to 135, 140, somewhere in there, 130 will take, um, it takes five or 10 minutes to get your heart rate that high. Um, and we want to keep it there for a half hour. 
that is an antidepressant dose of exercise three times a week. And the in Blumenthal's wow. landmark studies, brisk walking was more effective than the medication long term. It was equally effective short term over three months, more effective over the six month follow up. Um, exercise has profound beneficial effects on the brain, more beneficial than anything I've talked about so far, except possibly sleep. Um, so it's, it's a really critical intervention. Again, we all know we need it. We just need to figure out what, you know, how can we make it happen? Uh, going on a brisk walk, you know, nowadays we have podcasts, um, or I think even better walking with a friend or loved one, you know, um, walking in nature makes it even better. You can get your sunlight. You can, I mean, it's, you know, it's just a win, win, win. So that would be the first, the, the, you know, if the weather doesn't cooperate, then maybe, um, you know, we have YouTube and there are, are some amazing workout videos on YouTube to any taste, whether it's like a Zumba dance class or, um, something that's resistance training, like weightlifting, that's only body weight. So like, you know, routine of different push-ups and pull-ups and things that can be aerobic if we do enough of them, um, all kinds of, um, different cardio things. I mean, and they're free. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, these are things that people used to pay hundreds of dollars for, you know, back in the day, you guys are too young, but you know, like we'd have these VHS tapes or, uh, beta max or, or, um, you know, we even had these things called DVDs, which, you know, nowadays it's all streaming, but it's all free. People, people just, huge money. For this stuff. No, I think it's really good as well to, to outline kind of the minimum. Cause I think some people feel like, you know, you see these athletes where they feel like, oh, I've, I've got to do that. And, and we compare ourselves to these athletes. It's like, yeah, well, actually, I was just talking to a friend yesterday and that she, I was saying, well, like, wouldn't it be great to have like a body like Rafa Nadal? It's like, yeah, Rafa Nadal trains eight hours a day, every day, because that's his job. And even when he's playing, that's his job. Like, you don't, you sit down for eight hours a day because that's your job. Like, you're never going to have Rafa's body. So just like scale it back. And I think it's really useful for people to know that, like, what, like you said, three times, half an hour of 75% of your of your max heart rate is the the minimum the sufficient amount to basically act as like an, an antidepressant medicine um I, we've got two more we've got two more of your six steps um to touch on because we've already touched right at the beginning of the podcast on social connection the other one um there's two more so the, one of them is engaged activity and how it stops ruminating um could like could you kind of speak to that and, and expand on that and what what counts as engaged activity yeah, well, so one of the real hazards of modern life is the amount of time that people spend either alone and or just mentally disengaged, mentally half present, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, for a lot of Americans, it's, it's sitting in traffic, you know, commuting. Um, but a lot of times, even when people are, are interacting with a screen, whether it's... Um, streaming or social media or whatever, they're just kind of scrolling mindlessly. And, and when we're doing that very often, um, I mean, psychologically, scientifically, we found that people are very often ruminating, brooding, dwelling on negative thoughts, negative themes, memories, or worries about the future. And um, when people are clinically anxious, they spend a lot of time ruminating about things they're worried about. For the future when they're clinically depressed they spend a lot of time ruminating about things that they're sad about from the past so that's an interesting little rule of thumb right we can ruminate about either the future or the past depending on our mood state and depending on what's going on with us clinically but they're both really toxic uh, when we ruminate it amplifies uh, our stress response and remember i didn't i didn't really emphasize this point but um stress not only uh, messes with our sleep architecture, robs us of that restorative phase of sleep. But the runaway stress response is actually a big, big, big driver of clinical depression. Um, when our brain is in runaway stress response mode for too long, other circuits of the brain look at that and they say, oh, this is bad. We got to shut everything down. We're, we're physically ill now. 
And that's a lot of what clinical depression is, is just like the brain and the body just shut down completely. And uh, the runaway stress response is the single, it's not the only, but it's the single most important driver and sustainer of that. So anything we can do to slam the brakes on the stress response will have antidepressant benefit. And rumination, dwelling on negative thoughts, is perversely one of the best things we can do to keep that stress response going, right? The more we ruminate, the more stressed out we get, the more it sustains it. And so learning to recognize when it's happening and learning then to put the brakes on rumination, to redeploy our attention onto something else. Well, what are we going to put our attention on? If I notice that I'm ruminating right now, well, I got to break it. How do I break it? Well, I've got to shift my spotlight of attention onto something that's more engaging or equally engaging that I'm making a choice now to attend to. Well, what's that going to be? Well, could be uh, activity with another human being, shared activity, something that we both enjoy or something that we're both interested in. It could be a solo activity. Um, I play uh, guitar and piano, not very well, but it's just for me, mostly. I mean, I have played a little bit publicly, but we're not going to talk about that. And, um, but, you know, it's super engaging, super engaging for me. And so that's like a go-to. I've got a, literally, I could turn my camera, I'm not going to, I could turn my camera around and show you a grand piano sitting in my living room um, that somehow I was, I was lucky enough to have, have bought right before the pandemic. It was a splurge. It was crazy. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? But it turned out to be so therapeutic, so therapeutic during the pandemic, right? Because it's right there and it's so soothing um, and anti-ruminative. Now, notice that just like exercise, there's no one, one size fits all, right? Everybody's going to have to do the experimentation to figure out like, what is anti-ruminative for me? Sometimes it's as simple as just changing the scenery. So if I notice that I'm ruminating a lot, like when I'm in the kitchen, Maybe while I'm cleaning, you know, maybe I'm doing the dishes or I'm cooking or chopping or what, and I'm ruminating. Well, maybe I need to take a break and, and you know, go outside for a bit or just, you know, it turns out that a lot of times um, there are contextual primes for our thoughts. So we get in the habit of thinking certain kinds of things in certain places. So changing the scenery can really help. Um, turns out that writing stuff down, um, you know, I tell my patients, like, give yourself 10 minutes, get out a notebook. And knock yourself out. Set a timer for 10 minutes. Knock yourself out. Do all your ruminating on paper for 10 minutes. But then crumple it up, throw it away, walk away. And it's really powerful. Um, doing a little gratitude exercise often can be really helpful in the short, you know, just like what are three, like not the big things, not like, oh, I'm grateful for my partner. I'm grateful for my kids, you know, whatever. But like, I'm grateful for, um, you know, the the bird that I um I heard singing this morning and, you know, that was a really cool moment, you know, just like some little thing. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Jim, I saw your hand up a second ago. Um, I think. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that a, a friend of our, a friend of the podcast, uh, a Buddhist teacher called Adam Starr, I'm sure if he was listening to this, he would say, Jesus, this sounds a lot like Steve, you recommended people to kind of to meditate and not even meditate, sit down and focus on it. But like you said, throughout the day, just be able to notice, oh, my mind's wandering here. Let me bring it back. And uh, I, I just know personally for me, when I started meditation practice, it was much easier to kind of nip those like anxious driven or depressed driven thoughts in the book because you notice them quite quickly and you're just going, oh, I don't know if I want to follow that because we all know those thoughts can get very, very long. And you start thinking about, oh, what if I did that? Or what if I did this? Or what if this happens? And then that might happen. And then I'm a failure. And then everyone's going to find out this and, you know, the thoughts go crazy. But I had never heard it yeah. in the way you speak about it, anti-ruminative. I think that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you. I think um, mindfulness is a really useful concept because I think at its core, a lot of mindfulness is really about being awake, being awake and attentive. It, it's, you know, I could be really fancy and say, it's about cultivating meta attention, attending to what we're attending to, noticing what we're noticing, noticing what we're thinking about. And, and that's really critical in breaking the rumination habit because people tend to ruminate mindlessly. 
when they're on autopilot and they get really good at ruminating without even noticing what they're thinking about. And then they stop and they're like, oh, I'm doing it, you know, but it might be like after an hour. Um, and so learning how to notice all day long, what am I, what am I thinking about? What am I attending to? That's, that's a big, big time mindfulness skill. It doesn't require meditation. Although I think for many people, meditation would be helpful um, because mindfulness is about more than just meditation, right? It's, it's, it's sort of a way of, of attending and being present. Um, so yeah, I, we don't talk a lot about mindfulness in the TLC program, um, which might be a strategic mistake. I don't know. When we first formulated it, uh, there was a lot of research coming out saying that when people were acutely depressed, they had trouble learning mindfulness. They had trouble learning how to meditate um, because their depressive thoughts were just so negative and dark. And um, some really influential researchers um, one in Canada, one in the UK, uh, a guy named Zindel Siegel in Canada and, um, uh, Teasdale, I can't re recall his first name in, in the UK. They, they tried mindfulness based cognitive therapy for depression. And they found that they could train people when they were recovered and that it was very protective. So, you know, in other words, when somebody had already kind of started to come out of their depression, they, then they could really easily learn mindfulness training. And once they learned it, that was protective, but it was hard. I think now um, some folks have kind of broken the code and they figured out, no, you can, if, if you're willing to be creative and patient, you can train somebody even while they're fully syndromally depressed, but that's not my bailiwick. Okay. Um, I'm very open to it though, for sure. Great, great, great connection though. It's, it's great. So, and, and it, it, the, the last, the last point we have that you have, sorry, we taking credit for your work now here. Um, yeah. <laughs> the last point that you have, yeah, <laughs> the last work that you have, um, point that you have is probably the easiest to implement. I mean, just right now is just Amiga three, but I was surprised to see it there just because, and this is just for my own ignorance and maybe some of the listeners share this, but I just always see, I knew it was good for you, Amiga three. You always hear that, but I just kind of, assuming it's like good for your joints and it is. that type of stuff. I never put Omega-3 and the brain together. So when you said that it was kind of you wanted, you know, one of your six pillars to help you overcome depression, that took me back a bit. But like I said, it's the easiest one to implement because all you have to do is just go to your local pharmacy or maybe a supermarket and just buy buy the tablets and start taking them. So so why is it so yeah. important? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so, well, first I, I want to say I didn't, when I started asking the question, like, you know, what are the Kaluli people doing that's so protective? You know, why don't they get depressed? Because they have really hard lives. They have like crazy high rates of infant mortality. They have high rates of parasitic illness. They, they have a much lower life expectancy than we do, but they don't get clinically depressed very often. Um, I didn't go into it with an agenda of like, oh, I'm a big proponent of omega-3s or anything else. I, you know, the, the agenda was just, what do we have the most robust research support for that, you know, that we know that they're doing that we're not, that we know is antidepressant and the research. So I was thinking, well, there has to be a nutritional angle because their diets are so different, but I wasn't necessarily thinking it was going to be about essential fatty acids per se, but I very quickly ran into a whole literature showing that um, we talked earlier about uh, diseases of civilization and how, a lot of them are inflammatory. A lot of them are auto, autoimmune is, is adjacent to inflammatory. And, you know, then I very quickly stumbled onto this enormous medical literature showing that the fats that we consume play a critical role in the development of hormones that are regulating inflammation, hormones that can be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, and that these fatty acid precursors that we get from our diet. Um, and, you know, we, we, we hear them in terms of, of fancy chemical terms like omega-6 or omega-3, which just has to do with technical details of a double carbon bond in the molecule um, and how many places away from the end. Omega is last letter of the Greek alphabet. So if you hear omega-3, you think, oh, the, the double carbon bond is three units from the end. And if it's omega-6, it's six units from the end. Um, you know, I'm not an organic chemist, but I, I was like really, really fascinated by the fact that like, oh, 
So if we have a diet that is like the Kaluli, we don't have a lot of inflammation because we're getting a lot of omega-3, which is a building block for anti-inflammatory or at least non-inflammatory hormones. And uh, we have a lot less omega-6, which can be a building block for a lot of inflammatory hormones. So things are more in balance. We call these as essential fats because the body can't make them. We only get them from diet. And omega-3s come from uh, plants and the animals that eat them, basically. So if we have a meat supply that's uh, free range, you know, pastured, uh, or even, you know, like eggs where the, the hens are um, free range and they're eating uh, leaves and insects, which also are eating leaves, um, then, then we get a lot of omega-3 in our eggs. If, if, if they're being fed, like most um, of our meat supply, if they're being fed grain to fatten them up quickly, corn usually, then that's a great source of omega-6, which means inflammation. So, you know, A, it was really quickly apparent scientifically that our diets are very inflammatory. But then I was blown away by the, the quality and strength of research on omega-3 supplementation as a very powerful little antidepressant intervention that's very simple, uh, which is good when somebody's depressed, right? Because you know their energy is low and their motivation is low and their 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 bandwidth is low. So they really appreciate something that's just super, super easy. It's not terribly expensive. Um, it's well tolerated. The side effects are usually pretty low. So uh, you know, even if you look at the effect size of omega-3 supplement versus placebo. In a fancy study we call meta-analysis, where you're aggregating across different studies, the meta-analytic effect size for omega-3s is larger than the meta-analytic effect size for antidepressant meds, which is pretty remarkable. And it's very little known. But, you know, mm -hmm. now the cynical take would be, well, there's no money to be made or there's not very much money to be made selling fish mm -hmm. oil because, you know, it, it's not very profitable. It's not very expensive. Uh, there's no patent on it. Well, I, actually, there, there there is, but you you can actually believe it or not, the drug companies decided they were going to finesse a way to patent uh, omega three fats, icosapentaenoic acid, which is the main anti inflammatory fat. There's a way that you can bind it that they patented that process, so they can actually sell a drug called uh, Core Omega uh, by prescription in the U S. But you know, you can just get fish oil at your local health food store. So um, yeah, I just, I was really blown away by the evidence and thought, well, this is like, this moves the needle so much. Like, even though it sounds kind of ridiculous, like we can't not do this. Mm. It's so helpful for so many. People. I said, we, we were lucky to have uh, Professor Julia Rookledge on the podcast a few months ago and she spoke something similarly. She, she referenced a lot of experiments where they had clinically depressed clients or, or students or uh, people in the experiment and they would give one a placebo and one they would put them on a mediterranean diet and the people who went on the mediterranean diet benefited considerably their systems some uh, i think 50 percent of the symptoms reduced after eight to 12 weeks and then um, yeah. when we were talking to her she, she has a book out called the better brain and she would reference all of these 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 very respectable and legitimate experiments to say that this nutrition this like you said at the very start of this podcast this processed food that we're eating is 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 clearly getting in the way of our health here and and then i think the big thing is and you seem to be as shocked as we were when we, when we came across this people think oh you eat processed food yeah it's bad because you might get fat or it's bad for your energy levels or these things but no it's it's actually very bad for your brain yes yeah, yeah exactly and you know one of the surprising things uh just to build on that jim when it's hard for me to believe that it's actually been 17 years since the very first research meeting that I had with my team when we started thinking about how to craft this kind of lifestyle-based protocol. But in those early meetings, we had no idea about a real uh, cutting-edge frontier now that's just exploding, um, which I'm sure you know about, the, the gut-brain microbial axis. So the you know, the, the community of, of microbes that largely reside in the gut um, that 
number in the trillions and that turn out to be really, really good at hacking into our brains. And they have their own agenda. Uh, it's usually the, the, the friendly ones, their agenda is pretty lined up with ours. So it works out for the most part. Um, the unfriendly ones, the non-symbiotic microbes, they're, they're a lot more trouble. But, but um, you know, it turns out, back to the Mediterranean diet, that the, the, not only does the Mediterranean diet give lots more omega-3s than, than the standard American or European diet, but um, it also gives a lot of rocket fuel for beneficial microbes that, again, hack the brain and they want us to, to the, the friendly microbes want us to be thriving. They want us to be healthy. They want us to be active and social and uh, non-anxious, non-stressed. And um, so they thrive on plant fiber, which is in abundance in the Mediterranean diet and is pretty mm -hmm. much negligible in the typical fast food, processed food diet. Um, so to make matters even worse, a lot of the bad actor, uh, parasitic inflammatory microbes love processed sugar, love processed carbs, love processed fats. So, um, mm. yeah, the, the, the standard American diet is just so incredibly toxic to health long-term, short-term, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people... I mean, I, I ate like crap when I was a teenager. I ate like crap when I was in my early 20s and I could largely get away with it, you know, to a point. Mm -hmm. um, but most of my friends who did not s step up their game nutritionally, by the time they were in their 30s and 40s, they were already starting to succumb to lots of different chronic health conditions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we, we can get away with it for a while when we're young. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah, I, I, we, Jim and I actually have planned to talk, like, to do a podcast on, um, like, the, well, the Italian diet specifically, but, um, and, like, their whole kind of belief system almost around food. But one of, like, the critiques I always hear of people who maybe aren't kind of aware of what, because a lot of people think of the Mediterranean diet and they kind of just immediately think of the Italian diet, which then they immediately think of pasta and pizza. And they go, well, that's like the fattiest stuff for me. And it's like one of the big difference because, yeah, it's true in Italy. I can speak uh, from experience. Every, and it's a gym can as well. You eat pasta every single day. That's a guarantee. But the difference is that's just one of the plates. And you, you only eat 100 to 125 per person, really, grams per person. Whereas, for example, in England, and I'm sure in America, when someone eats a bowl of pasta for lunch or dinner, that is their lunch or dinner. And so as a result, they'll eat maybe 250, maybe 350, maybe maybe in a whole packet of pasta. And they'll have that as their, that's, so then they equivalent that to what Italians eat. And they're like, well, why aren't Italians fat? It's because we're eating so much less. And also the difference of what they put on the pasta. You know, it's not, it's all freshly cooked sauces. It's not out of a jar. And the same with pizza. It's these thin, tiny, uh, you know, your, you said your family's from Naples. You can't get a more traditional pizza than the Napoli pizza. It's the thinnest crust with like a little bit of, of of tomato and some olive oil. That's there's nothing unhealthy about that. But once you start, you know these the Chicago pizza, which I'm not sure you can even call a pizza, but <laughs> these deep dishes with like tons of just fatty cheese and everything else, to then call that a pizza is like, you know what I mean? It's almost well, offensive. But in, that, in fairness, it, in fairness, it's 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 very delicious. It is, it is. I'm sure. Is I, I don't deny it. I don't deny it. But these people who kind of want or query why maybe their Italian ancestors who came over to America hundreds of years ago weren't fat, but now they're eating kind of pasta and pizza and they are fat. That's like one of the key differences. And I think as well, just speaking from English, like the English diet, which I think there's some similarities with the American. It's not just the actual food that we eat, but the way that we eat is that. In England, it's kind of like eat until you're really full, like until mm -hmm. you can't move. And then that's when the meal's finished. Whereas like in Italy, it's kind of, or in Spain as well, it's eat until you're, you know, you're not hungry anymore, but you can still happily walk around and not feel like you're going to be rolled down the road. And that's a big difference that I've noticed, as opposed to, you know, the English to the Mediterranean diet. And I think in, 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 in America as well, because when I've gone there and when Jim went to New Jersey, we were like astounded with what was classed as like a normal 
size. Even just you go to McDonald's, for example, like what's a large McDonald's in America doesn't even exist in England because it would be an extra large or a double extra large in in, in America in, in an English McDonald's. So these like the sizes of the quantities of food that people eat is such a big difference as well. Huge, yeah. And also, you know, just to add to that, the the foods that are eaten, say, in traditional Mediterranean diets, like uh, in Greece or Southern Italy, they're they're much more bulky in terms of the constituent fiber. It's a lot of fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, whole grain, right? I mean, it's it's um, and sparing levels of of anything processed or you know usually even the meat mm. is not the main ingredient it's really more centered around whole whole fruits and vegetables and grains and again that is rocket fuel for our beneficial microbes and they hack into the brain through the vagus nerve which runs from the gut to the brain directly by releasing neurotransmitters into the blood, by manipulating our immune cells that then release chemicals that cross into the brain. And those beneficial microbes are phenomenal at putting the brakes on our stress response, which means they have an antidepressant potential. And if we've been on many rounds of antibiotic, by the way, then we might have obliterated a lot of these friends of ours and to open the door for a lot of the bad actors to come and populate our, our guts. So, you know, yeah. the solution for a lot of people may also involve for a time being obsessed with eating a lot of fermented foods because they, they have a lot of uh, microbes that can instantly take root in our gut. And then maybe even some probiotic supplements, uh, yeah. along with, you know, changing our diet, or if we're too lazy to change our diet right now, even taking a soluble fiber supplement in the form of psyllium husk, that's with a P, P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M, psyllium husk, or chicory root extract. These are like pure soluble fiber. And uh, you can take them as a supplement. And they're they're really, really beneficial mm. for a lot. Well, I'm not giving medical advice to your listeners, but, you know, they'll all want to talk to their their doctor for <laughs> For any of these things, before they make any of these changes, um, and hopefully you'll, you'll put that disclaimer in the podcast as well at the, at the outset. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Yeah, we'll put the disclaimer there. I mean, thank you so much for your time. I think it's been really, you've been really generous with it. And I, you know, for anyone who's who's made it all the way to the podcast, they'll have definitely kind of gained something there because those six steps, I think they're really easy to implement when you actually put your mind to it you're not asking of any crazy thing and 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 also i think it's something that we can always we can put in into place if we're not depressed you know what i mean just to have as a barrier you don't have to always prevention is better than cure as they always say um so thank you so much for for your time before you go i know you've written a book where m- people can maybe kind of read about this in more detail um and obviously you give ted talks and so on so could you possibly maybe kind of just tell us plug your book and then also maybe as social media if you're on it or, or where can people kind of find your work sure um yeah so thank you so the book is called the depression cure and that that's a little bit hyperbolic. I, I, I had very mixed feelings about the title, um, talking to my publisher and my agent. But it, it as I try to explain in, in the uh, intro for the book, I'm, I'm really talking about the fact that people like the Kaluli are living an intrinsic cure, a prevention and a cure for depression. In other words, lifestyle holds the promise of healing us and keeping us well. And mm. uh, there, there certainly are some medical conditions that can sustain a depression if they're not properly diagnosed. So for example, somebody has horrible sleep apnea or if they have hypothyroidism or, you know, there are lots of, lots of different diseases that if a person does everything in my book, all the six steps and they do it to the letter, but they don't get their sleep apnea under control, you know, they will still have some depressive symptoms for sure. Right. Um, so I, I always advise people see a healthcare provider, work with a professional to get through your depression. But on the other hand, I've, I've heard now from literally 
probably thousands of readers or people that have watched TED Talks that have said, hey, I know you said I should, you know, see a professional, but I just like, I was so desperate. I just started doing this stuff as best I could, or my, my partner helped me, whatever. And, you know, a lot of people do find enormous benefit. Um, so yeah, the book is The Depression Cure. My, um, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter. My Twitter handle is um, at Dr. Alardi, D-R period, Alardi. Uh, listeners should be warned that I um, have a lot of far-flung interests. So I don't always just tweet about psychology or science. I, I've tweeted a lot about the pandemic, I've tweeted a lot about um, NBA basketball, which is my hobby and my uh, avocation. I've, I've actually consulted. I've, I've worked for a couple of NBA teams. Um, okay, I, tweet, I tweet a fair amount about American politics, which many, many, many people are not happy with me about. But I can't help it because I think it matters a lot uh, <laughs> in our current, current moment. Uh, so um, if if there are any super huge fans of the previous regime, uh, just be forewarned that I'm not. Um, so you'll just have to take <laughs> with that. Uh, uh, but yeah. And Stephen, oh, just, and I, just before. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to say also, um, as you mentioned yourself, you're a bit hesitant about the, the title of the book, but you are the author of a book that says The Depression Cure. Um, are, are there times where it's difficult? As in, like, you've done so much research about well-being. Is it is it almost sometimes hard to to practice what you preach or to, yeah, to really embody what you are uh, instilling in, in other people? Oh yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. I that wasn't my hesitation about the title. I you know I've been very very lucky um, in so many ways. I think one of which is maybe even just genetically. I, I probably uh, don't have a lot of vulnerability to clinical depression, um, even though I have many family members who have uh, four close family members who've been clinically depressed. But I I have been lucky enough. Um, I should knock on wood here. Uh, lucky enough so far to, uh, to to never have have experienced depression. Um, but I, you know, I think I understand it um, because so many people that I love and have cared about have. I mean, I've witnessed it so up close. And you know, frankly, I think all of us know the incredible pain of suffering, loss the pain of suffering, sadness and setback and bereavement. Um, I lost uh, our, our family dog of 18 years last month. And, you know, it was just another reminder of like, God, this is so incredibly painful. And, and that's, yeah. and I also know that that's nothing like the pain of clinical depression, because at least I could point to like, I know what caused this, right? And for many of my patients, they're suffering even more and they don't even know why. Their brain is just shutting them down and they're just aching, throbbing. Um, no, I think the reason I, I didn't like the title of my book very much is that I'm a scientist and I never want to overpromise. I always want to put in 18,000 disclaimers and caveats and, you know, it's like, well, cure asterisk, and then all the footnotes and all that. You know, it was it was just more mm -hmm. like I, I just I felt like it was irresponsible for me as a scientist to use the word cure, um, even though many of the people that I've treated have, you know, by by any reasonable standard, have found a cure for their depression. But I I also know that there are people who don't. Because, you know, maybe they have undiagnosed sleep apnea or maybe they have undiagnosed cancer or they have, you know, or they have, oh, they have post-traumatic stress disorder that's never been addressed. And until their PTSD mm. is adequate, that's enough to keep their depressive symptoms going, you know. So there, there, there are so many caveats and, and, and disclaimers that de depression is a very tricky and treacherous foe. And I have enormous respect for it. I consented to the title, The Depression Cure, because my publisher convinced me that that's the message of hope that so many people needed to hear. 
Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if I was responsible to explain to them that I'm really not about, you know, I'm not a charlatan, I'm not selling snake oil, I'm not promising 100% <laughs> money back, you know, um, that it was okay. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I made my peace with it, but there are still days when I wish I could un- unwind the hands of time and go back and say, screw it. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to put my foot down. I'm going to use a more modest title like healing depression or something. And then I can hear my agent saying, mm-hmm. yeah, and you'll sell like maybe 20% of the number of books and you'll help so many <laughs> fewer people. There. You know, I, I mean, I swear to God, Jim, there are, and, and this sounds really immodest and I don't mean it to, but I, I literally get, at least once a month and sometimes more than that, an email from a complete stranger saying, I would not be alive today if not for your work. And it's incredibly yeah. humbling. And, um, you know, it's like, what do you do with, with something like that? It's, it's, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just a vessel, but, um, you know, it's like if this title, which pisses me off, is still able to help some people, you know, find the hope they needed to get better, you know, then I can take the hit on that. It's fine. People can yell at me. And and by people, I mean my colleagues, my scientific colleagues. They're like, you're a sellout. <laughs> you're not scholarly. And I'm like, well, you know. <laughs> Well, we, we we found you because of that title. So, you know, maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation without such a title. And and like there you said, you you've been on other podcasts beforehand who, who have reached out to you because of your book. And, you know, this, this is all kind of like the butterfly effect. And if that meant that you had to kind of uh, not be so modest, and like you said, if that m- means that you reach more people and, and get to help more people, then maybe it's a deal worth making, I think, at the end of the day. Um, but thank you so much for coming on to this podcast. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And it's been well worth the wait, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much, Sav. It's It's been been truly a pleasure and uh, love getting to know you both of you guys. And, you know, hope we can keep the uh, the connection going down the road. Well, so. sure. We're all going to Italy next summer. <laughs> there there we go. Go. <laughs> oh my god so we got to have a, a, a yeah. great Mediterranean dinner uh share a bottle of wine maybe uh this, this is gonna so be brilliant get those um get those omega threes in you know it will be beautiful it'll be and the sunlight shining down it'll be beautiful i'm here for it <laughs> thanks beautiful guys stuff. Right. bye-bye bye hi guys thank you for listening to the podcast Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already. Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week. But until then, keep safe and have a good one.